Good day, this is Bill McLeod uh, speaking from Winnipeg, Canada. I want to speak on the subject of Christian love. And um, remember that Paul, in the last verse of 1 Corinthians 13, that great love chapter, he said, and now abides, that is, he'd been talking about all the gifts, and now he's talking about the three gifts that remain, that abide, that are there when the others are all gone, perhaps. And now by faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these, he said, is love. God is love, twice given in 1 John chapter 4. God is love. God doesn't have to try to love. God is love. There's times when we have to try to love unlovely people. God never has that problem. He sends rain and sunshine on the field of the unjust as well as in the field of the just. He's told us that plainly. And uh, so, God is love. And we have become partakers of God's nature, so we read in 2 Peter 1, 4, which means that we as a Christian believer must likewise be walking in love. We were chosen to be loving, you know, Ephesians 1, 4, according as, according as he has chosen us in him, that is in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him, in love, it says. You and I were chosen to be loving people, loving people. I heard Dr. Price from the uh, People's Church in Toronto give an illustration that was quite interesting. I'm not sure I have all the facts right, but here's sort of like it went. Uh, he was talking about a, a pastor, I believe in Chile, had a large church, but nothing was ever happening. So one Sunday morning, the pastor simply told the people, uh, my text uh, for today is uh, love one another. And then he just sat down, didn't preach, just sat down. And nothing happened. People sitting there wondering what's going on. So he got up again and said, the text is love one another. And somehow they got the text, and then things began to happen in the congregation. People began moving around, talking with each other, and praying in little groups here and there. And they heard later on that six unemployed men got a job that morning through the church. And it was wonderful. So then, the next Sunday, he said, now my text today is, love your neighbor as yourself. And he sat down, in five minutes, there wasn't a person left in the church. They'd all gone to find their neighbor. And love him. Well, that's unusual. But anyway, there are ten such references in the New Testament. We discover that love is, was the goal of Christ teaching the twelve. John seventeen twenty six. He said to his heavenly Father in that high priestly prayer of his, "I have declared unto them your name, that the love wherewith you have loved me may be in them, and I in them." So he's not really talking about just human love jacked up a little bit. He's talking about the love of God, the love that Christ had for, or that God had for Christ, that that love might be in the twelve apostles. That was his goal. It was also the goal of apostolic teaching because in First Timothy one five, Paul said, uh, to quote from a different de translation, perhaps the end of a commandment is, or the goal of our instruction is, is what is love rising out of a pure heart, not of a good conscience, not of a genuine faith. So love, that's the goal. And that was the goal of apostolic teaching. First Peter 1, 22, if you recall, seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit, unto, and that Greek word means motion toward. Motion towards what? Unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. And then uh, First Peter 4, 8. Uh, we're to, again called on to love one another. And of course, 1 Corinthians 13 is one of the greatest chapters in the Bible, and even people who are not believers in, in God, reading that chapter, say it was, a tr it was a tremendous, tremendous thought. That Paul was certainly inspired in some sense. But we know it was not in some sense, it was the Spirit of God, but to the worldly people, that's how they look at it. All right, love covers the multitude of sins, we read in First Peter uh, 4, 8. Love covers the multitude of sins. Have fervent love among yourselves, for love shall cover the multitude of sins. 
1 Corinthians 13, 7 says, and this I think is, a, is the nearest to a definition of love we can possibly get. What does it say? Love seeks not her own. Love does not seek her own. Then we, f we find that uh, love believes all things, 1 Corinthians 13, 7. Faith works by love, Galatians 5, 8, faith works by love. Uh, Spurgeon said that love comes when self dies. And he had a little poem, praising God with all my might in the sea of God's delight. Self is drowned and I am free. Christ and love remain in me. All right, faith works by love. Second Corinthians 5.14 declares that the love of Christ constrains us. It's a constraining power. You can't think of the love of Christ without being constrained to love others because you are joined to Christ and have become one spirit with him. All right, hereby we proceed. Now, proving the sincerity of my lover of God's love, 1 John 3.16, hereby we perceive the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren, that is, for the work of God. In 2 Corinthians 8.8, 8, he used this phrase, Paul did, the proof of your love, and in 8.24, to prove the sincerity of your love. And if you look at carefully at these two verses and the context, he's talking about giving to God. You can measure the love you have for God by the way you give to God and to his work. We're told, and I'm sad to say this, but we're told that probably not more than 15% percent of people in the average evangelical church are tied their income, only 15%. And people say, well, that's an Old Testament deal. No, it's not. In Matthew 23, 23, uh, Christ, speaking of the time, said, these you ought to have done. So it's something we ought to do. And it's promised in Malachi 3, as you know, verse 10 and on, to really bless those people who give him the tithe. Otherwise, we're robbing God. Romans 12, 9 says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Is it possible to have a hypocritical love? Yes, it is. Like this speaks in one place, Ezekiel um, with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goes after their covetousness. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So we may have a hypocritical love. We shouldn't have, but we may have. You know, sometimes people say, you know, I could have helped that guy out, but I didn't have that love feeling. What's, what are you talking about, a love feeling? Love is a power. Love is as strong as death, we're reading the Song of Solomon. It's a powerful, powerful thing. And it's harder to resist it than to move with it. And we need to be looking for people that we can help, we can love, we can help out, and, and uh, comfort and exhort and so on. So it's Ezekiel 33, 31, with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goes after their covetousness. And then 1 John 3, 18, we're not talking in word or in tongue, but indeed in truth. I had meetings in Minnesota at a, at a camp, a conference, we had a wonderful time there, and um, we met a man whose name was Justin Time. This was not his real name, but he had his name changed from whatever it was to Justin Time, because he said, I got saved, Justin Time. He was in the drunk culture in... Uh, California, and one night a Christian girl saw him lying there drunk, and she ministered to him, and, uh, you know, he got saved, he accepted Christ, and then they got married. It was a real romance. The police force in the Twin Cities, uh, they had him on call, and if they have a man threatening suicide and going to jump from some building, they get just in time in there. And in 95% of the cases, he was able to talk them out of it. He was such a loving character, you know. Just had a sweet, loving way about him. And people would listen to him. But that shouldn't be a peculiar thing. That should be the way we all are. People say, I don't have that kind of personality. It's got nothing to personality. You know, people mistake uh, personality for personality. 
No, no matter who you are, it doesn't say you're to love providing you have a loving personality. It doesn't ever say that. Now, the Holy Spirit, and we all want to be filled with the Spirit, is a spirit of love. Romans 15.30 speaks about the love of the Spirit. So he is a loving Spirit. And then Colossians 1.8, your love in the Spirit. And then Romans 5, 5, the love of God is shed abroad, poured out, says in one translation, into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given unto us. So the Spirit living within us is constantly trying to shed abroad the love of God in our hearts. So we'll be what we should be, a partaker of God's divine nature. May I just say this, if you're not filled with love, you're not filled with the Spirit. I remember one time at a meeting, I'd been counseling some people, and then a lady came down the aisle dragging her husband. Uh, he was a very unwilling uh, follower. And uh, she got him to the front, and then she said to me, Speak to my husband. He's a backslider. Well, <laughs> I started talking to him. He says, Look, preacher, I'm not ready for this. She said, You know, I wouldn't come here, but if I hadn't come, she'd have made my life a hell on earth at home. So I ignored him. Then I said to her, Are you a Christian? Absolutely, she said. Are you feeling similar? Absolutely, she said. I speak in tongues 30 minutes every day. I said, I didn't ask if you spoke in tongues. I asked you if you were filled with the Spirit. You know, you can be, you can speak in tongues and not be filled with the Spirit. Well, how can that be? She said, I don't know how it can be, but I know it can be. So I said, are you really filled with the love of God? You speak in tongues 30 minutes a day. Are you really filled with the love of God? And she said, well, um, I have a few little problems. I said, tell me about your little problems. And she said, well, I, uh, I'm insanely jealous of my husband. And he shook his head up and down. And then she said, I sometimes I have a horrible temper. And she said, I, uh, I sometimes blaspheme when I get angry. And I, I have sometimes blasphemed God. And I said, sister, listen, you're not filled with the Spirit of God. You're full of self. You're filled with self. You need to die to yourself. And she fell on her knees and began to weep, and she wept her way to God. And so I say again, if you're not filled with love, you're not really filled with the Spirit. The, fir the first fruit of the Spirit is love, right? The fruit of the Spirit is love. That's the first thing. If it's not there, you don't have it. You know, Finney had a remarkable experience. He, he declared he didn't even know there's such a thing as a baptism of the Spirit of God. And uh, he accepted Christ out there in the woods, and he'd been struggling with this whole thing about being a Christian. And he came in and sat down by his fireplace. And suddenly he was filled with the Spirit of God in the most remarkable way. He said he was being fanned by gigantic wings of love. And it went on and on and on and on. He went to bed that night, woke up in the middle of the night, and these baptisms of love came back again. I believe it was the next day when every person he spoke to found Christ as their Savior. And before he died, it's computed that likely half a million people found Christ as their Savior. I know many Christians, they don't uh, believe in Finney because some of his doctrine they said isn't right. And I know that he was not quite straight in some doctrines, but he was certainly straight on the place of Christ and uh, the need of being born again by the Holy Spirit of God. Moody had a fantastic experience, much like Finney's, only he was walking down the street in Chicago, and the Spirit of God came on him and so filled him with the love of God. He rushed to a friend's house and asked if he could have a room where he could be alone, and he spent hours there while these baptisms of love just coursed through his body. You know, up until then, he saw two saved here, three there, maybe a family there, he said, I never preached any different sermons. I preached the same sermons as before after this experience. But he said, then hundreds were being saved. Hundreds were being saved. You know, love is called the royal law in James 2.8. And uh, listen, if you don't have it, you've missed the royal law, the, the one great law, the law you must have to be filled. But to be filled, dear people, we must, first of all, be empty. God can't superimpose, baptize you with the Holy Spirit and the love of God. His self is in control. So self must die. Reckon you also yourselves, it says in Romans 6, to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. All right, we said before, love comes when self dies. 
Then we discover that love is from the Lord. First Thessalonians 3.12, The Lord make you to increase an abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you, to the end. For what reason? To the end. To the end that God may, um, we may, God may find us filled at the coming of Christ. To the end that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. 1 Thessalonians 3.12 Romans 5.5 5 simply says, The love of God is shed abroad or poured forth in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. We noted that before. It comes from the Spirit of God. 1 Thessalonians 4.9 says, We're taught of God to love one another. But how does God teach us? In three ways, by precept, command, and example. Precept. In First John chapter 4, there's a verse that says, Beloved. And the word beloved means divinely loved ones. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that loves not, knows not God. Do you know that in First John, at five chapters, there are 12 places where love has made the acid test of reality in the Christian life. No love, you're not born again. You're not born again. All right. Taught of God by precept and by command. This is his commandment. That we should believe on the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave his commandment. I say to myself, why did he say this is his commandment when he gave us two commandments? Why didn't he say these are his commandments? People, it's because you can't, you can't really separate the one from the other. All right. So, this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave his commandment. So, loving Christ, love your neighbor. Then an example, precept, command, an example. Well, here it would be 1 John 3, 16, hereby we perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's the message of God. Then 1 Timothy 1, 5, love rise out of a pure heart. We mentioned that briefly before. Love rise out of a pure heart, of a good conscience, and a genuine, unfeigned faith. And so you can't be filled with the love of God if you don't have a pure heart. You can't be filled with the love of God if you don't have a good conscience. After some meetings in Chile one day, they brought me a man, and they, the fellow said, he doesn't know any English, so we can talk very clearly. Uh, he said he's got a very bad conscience, and he wants you to pray for him. I said, well, tell him it says in Hebrews chapter 13, pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience, and all things willing to honestly. So tell him I can't pray for him, because I'm only supposed to pray for people who have a good conscience, and he's got a bad conscience. So I, I told him through the interpreter, now, you need to go home, and ask God to search your heart and get right with God. And the tears running down his face, and I walked away. A day or two later, he came to see me. He was talking so fast. <laughs> the interpreter had to slow him down. He couldn't get it all. He just wanted to say, thank you, thank you, thank you. He told us how he went home that night after I told him to get his conscience cleared up. And he spent hours before God, and God searched his heart, and he dealt with every kind of sin God had showed him. And then he prayed to be filled with the love of God. People, it's essential. A good conscience. A good conscience. And a genuine faith. And a pure heart. Okay. Both love and faith come from God. In Ephesians 6.23. We're told that it comes from God the Father. Love and faith come from God. And sometimes, you know, we catch it from others. I knew a couple in Meadow Lake, Saskatchewan. He was a doctor and his wife was... Uh, they were both godly people. And... Um, they went away to China on holidays and left her parents uh, to look after their children. I'm not sure. I think they had three or four. And while they were in China, the grandparents took the children out for a walk, and a drunk teenager ran into them. The grandma died immediately. I think the grandpa died the following day. That was Blanche's parents. The children were not hurt. They had trouble finding the Johnsons in China, but they finally found them and got them back, and there was a funeral and all of that. And then Blanche asked, where is the young man that 
killed my mum and dad. And they said he's in jail. So she went to jail and asked permission to see him and talk to him, and they let her in. And she said something like this, you know, you killed my mom and dad, and I respect them much, I miss them very much, but I just want you to know that I forgive you because I'm a Christian. And you know, he found his face and began to cry, and, and she led him to Christ. Can't we learn something from that? Some little thing happens, and all of a sudden we have a, we, we feel tiffed, you know, somebody said something or didn't look at us right. And I remember my mother this is before she really, she was a Christian then, but not really totally in touch with God as she was later on. She came in one day and she said, I passed Mr. Loving, Mrs. Loving on the street, and she never even said hello. I think she's mad. I said, well, Mother, did you say hello to her? Indeed, she said, and why should I? <laughs> it was kind of funny, you know. Why, we, why was she expecting this Mrs. Loving to greet her when she didn't greet her? Anyway, the Lord make you to increase. From others, blanch, yes. Hebrews 10, 24 says, We are to provoke one another to love and to good works. Well, we know how to provoke others. Then we do it constantly. We're not to provoke others to feel bad. But we're to provoke them to, to love and to good works. And you can't do that unless you involve yourself in good works. And you can't do that if you're not a loving person. But you can if you are. Hebrews 10.24. So Philippians 1.9, Paul prayed, This I pray that your love may abound yet more and more, more and more. We're to, we're, we're to increase in love. We read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Uh, we're to increase in faith and love. All right, characteristics of true love. 2 Corinthians 13.5, love seeks not her own. Philippians 2.21 says, all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. Well, surely he was talking about non-Christian. No, he was talking about Christians, as the context says, because he said, I have no man like man who will naturally care for your state, for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. He's talking about Christians, self-centered Christians, living their little life selfishly, not thinking of others, not walking in love. You see, it says in Ephesians 5, when we're to walk in love, as Christ also loved us. That's not something you put on for an emergency. People, it's a way of life. It's a way of life. You walk in love constantly. So let no man seek his own, 1 Corinthians 10, 24 says, but every man another's wealth. And then Philippians 2, 4, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And then we're told, by love, serve one another. By love, serve one another. Philippians 2, 3 says, let each esteem other better than themselves. Where do you stand? Where do you stand in this area? Are you filled with the love of God? Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. You can't do that unless you're filled with the love of God. I would like to suggest this. Maybe you're driving a car down the road. Can you pull over to the side and have a few moments when you meet with God and ask Him to forgive you for your lack of love? Ask God to empty you that you might be filled. Would you do that? Or if you're at home, you can get alone in a room somewhere. Just get on your face before God and ask Him to forgive you for, for being a person who is not really a loving person. We're told to adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. And the word adorn, the Greek word there, is a word from which we get the English word cosmetic. And so what he's really saying, Paul is, the Spirit is saying through Paul, we are to adorn the doctrine. We're to make the gospel as, as uh, loving, beautiful as we possibly can. We're not to dress it up and change the wording. We're just to live a godly life because nothing backs up the gospel so much as people who walk in love to the glory of God. Love your neighbor yourself, give them ten times in the Bible. Is it three times in the Old Testament, seven times in the New? We're to love one another with a pure heart. Fervently, it says, being born again. Simply because you're born again, if you are, you want to love others with a pure heart. Fervently. Oh, may God bless you. God is waiting. 
Remember, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of love. The love of the Spirit, Romans 15, 30. And then your love in the Spirit, Colossians 1, 8. Let's get with it, people. I want to close in just a moment. Moody, the famous evangelist, not long before he died, he addressed a group of several hundred pastors. And here's one of the things he said with great emphasis. He said, brethren, hold the churches to love. This is where we've gone wrong. Oh yes, thousands are being converted. They compute that through his ministry half a million people had found Christ as their Savior in the states and in Great Britain and uh, so on. Uh, but he could see that thousands of these people, he was hearing from churches and pastors, his people were not really walking with God, you know. They were Christians, but not walking with God. So he said, hold the churches to love. This is where we've gone wrong. And maybe that's where you, as an individual believer, have gone wrong to. God bless you. God bless you, is my prayer. Amen. I think I'll...